Previously on the British Broadcasting Century podcast, we said goodbye to 2MT Riddle. Yes, that on-air rival to the BBC in 1922 and 1923 was now off the air. Peter Eckersley toasted 2MT's demise with a glass of water, upgraded to a glass of champagne by the sound of a pop gun. For the BBC, a long and lonesome road ahead, no other legal traffic to share the journey with until commercial radio five decades later. Except, no, what's this? There is one other vehicle ahead, one other licensed, legal, legitimate broadcasting station, and it's coming from a Daimler motor car with an in-car radio. Yes, this time up in Scotland. There were a couple of other radio stations existing in early 1923, and they are not the BBC. We have radio history expert Tony Curry joining us with the tale of these two early Scottish stations, and a second guest from Scotland to Somerset, and Neil Wilson of Watchit's Radio Museum. Like the Scottish stations this episode, we are nothing to do with the BBC. It's just me, Paul Carenza, driving this car solo, taking the long way round on this epic 100-year-old drive of the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London College. Hello, hello. Welcome to you. Uh, thank you for joining us here on the podcast. This is the podcast that uses the limitless, freewheeling nature of podcasting to tell the longest, slowest history of British broadcasting imaginable. And yet in hopefully the most informative, educational and entertaining way that we can. Yes, all sounds very Arethian, doesn't it? Firstly, excuse my sniffles, it's uh, rather a high pollen count at uh, this time of year. Uh, it's a busy time of it. We are halfway through this centenary year and uh, this whole broadcasting history project has grown and grown and ballooned somewhat. So I'm on tour aplenty at the minute, taking the first broadcast, The Battle for the Beeb in 1922. That's my solo show. That's been on tour around the country. I've been writing uh, the novel on all of this, which hopefully will be out by the end of the year. Let's see. And I've got at least two leads of uh, BBC historical research that I just can't talk about yet. But I will when I can. Let me just say, exciting times ahead here on the British Broadcasting Century podcast. But exciting times back then as well, because in our timeline of British broadcasting, we've reached mid-January of 1923. Two MT Rittle has left the airwaves. The CQ, the concert's ended. Sad Wales, the heterodyne. You must soon switch off your valves. I must soon switch off mine. Leaving the BBC as the only British broadcaster in the land. Almost. You see, this episode, there's a bizarre quirk of broadcasting history because technically, yes, the BBC had the sole right to broadcast. We were seeing the end of the experimental era, but north of the border, there were a couple of radio stations still doing their thing. Now, one was a hangover of the experimental pre-BBC days. Milligan's wireless station had the call sign 5MG taken from the initials of its operators. And one was an experimental pop-up station that was only ever going to last a few days. But it was actually so popular, they added a few extra broadcasts. It was all to help sell in-car radios. 2BP came on the air from Hewenden Road in Hindland on the 24th of January 1923. Now, it was a joint venture of Marconi and the local Daimler dealer. Now, the voice there of Tony Curry, broadcaster, author, and radio history enthusiast. I mean, I've got so many anoraks uh, that I'm a duffel coat. <laughs> <laughs> and anorak too. Yes, more from Tony coming up. He's a marvellous guest. And from Scotland to Somerset, we'll also hear from Neil Wilson and his radio museum in Watch It. <laughs> So let's begin with Neil. If you can get to Somerset this year, I highly recommend that you do. Go and see Neil's fantastic radio museum. It's not just radios either, TVs through the ages, gramophone players, but it's mainly radios and microphones, old mixing desks, vintage wireless kit from BBC reporters, even from the D-Day beaches. He's got the works. Now, I filmed a 20-minute tour of the museum with Neil himself. You can watch that on the YouTube link that I will put in the show notes. But here is a little audio taster. It's me with Neil Wilson in Watch It in Somerset. I started elsewhere at the old BBC transmitting station um, up at Washford Cross. And then I moved out of there about six years ago. Yeah. I've been setting up here ever since. So I, I opened a bit last year, but uh, this hopefully will be my first sort of proper Oh yeah, opening, so. absolutely. <laughs> well, this is really, I've come to the Radio Museum. It's here, now I should say where we are as well, isn't it? Because this is sort of 
the far corner of the landmass, but in a beautiful <laughs> yes. way. It is a beautiful place. So we're in the ironically named Watch It, given mm. that actually it's about audio largely. <laughs> well, look, let's should we just have a little tour? Is yeah, that like, yeah. what, where would you what would you point us to to, to right. begin with? What's a okay. good place, well, place to see? This is this is one of the <laughs> prize oh, exhibits. It's uh, part of a, a BBC medium wave radio transmitter. Only part, but uh, it's, it's rather rather special. This, yeah, yeah. this is one of the larger artefacts you have here, isn't yes. it? Yes. Is, uh, <laughs> it had to have a special it? concrete plinth made for it because of the weight. But, uh, Beautiful. Built by Marconi's at Chelmsford, assembled and tested there and then dismantled again. And in this case, taken to, to Moorside Edge, which is the BBC's North Regional Transmitting Station. But it's identical to what was at the Washford transmitter just up the road, which was built in 1933. Uh, okay. Um, these were first installed at Brookman's Park uh, at, at the, the North London station in 1929. Wow. But, uh, and this one from 1931, is it? Yeah. yeah. Now, this is not ah. the, the ingredients for a cake here. This oh, is yeah. like that. <laughs> You put your headphones into a mixing bowl and it, it, it sort of amplified the sound a bit so you didn't have to keep them on your head, you could hear them. <laughs> so the whole family could hear. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. And hidden amongst that, I see we've got here the first Radio Times. Yes, it was, yeah, the first issue. Fantastic. Not many of those, there was, because there was, wasn't there another one? It was it in Wales? They, they had a fire there last year, I think, and that was one of the original ones that was lost there. Oh right. So no, no, uh, there's no, one, no, one fewer no, now than there was no, last year. No, so right. treasure, treasure that one, yeah. More from Neil later. So grateful to him for showing me around and opening specially as well. So throughout this summer, I would highly recommend you get down there to the beautiful Somerset coast. You can even take a steam train there. It's like it in another era. Now, if you're really super quick, you can actually catch my live show, the first broadcast. I'm doing it in Watch It in just a few days from now. So you'd have to be incredibly quick. And I'm doing this show in conjunction with the Radio Museum there. Actually, though, it'll be at the Boat Museum down the road. They've just got more space. That will be on Saturday, the 25th of June. Do come to Watch It in Watch It. Uh, you can see the museum and see my one-man show. I'm also uh, taking my show to, uh, where else, Worthing and Ludlow Fringe in Shropshire, Bed Fringe, which is in Bedford, Tunney Wells, Royal Tunbridge Wells. That's it for the summer leg of the tour, but I'll be back in September in Guildford, Salford, Chelmsford, Bradford, anywhere ending in food, really. paulcarenza.com slash tour will tell you where I am. As for where the Radio Museum is, watch it in Somerset. Tell Neil I sent you, and the link is in the show notes to his fine shrine to the golden age of wireless. Now, like the Radio Museum, the story of this podcast isn't all BBC, you know. Oh, no sorry. As we've shown, I think, for the last 40-ish episodes, there's a huge pre-BBC backstory. And Auntie Beeb, of course, comes along in November of 1922. For 13 and a half weeks, you had the BBC and you had 2MT in Rittle. As for the other BBC rivals on the air, wait a decade, you get Radio Luxembourg, you get ITV in the 50s, pirate radio in the 60s, commercial radio, of course, in the 70s. But before that, right at the start of 1923, there was another legitimate, licensed, non-BBC radio station. Well, in fact, there were a couple and this was all just when 2MT closed down. For this, we head to Scotland and to a chap that I know we will be hearing from a few times on this podcast. So I'm going to call him our Scotland correspondent. It's broadcaster, historian and author, Tony Curry. You've written many books, haven't you, on these things? The Radio Times story? Yes. Um, and uh, you've done this, the story of Radio Clyde as well. And not quite altogether now. Not quite altogether now. And a concise history of British television, and you have um, your voice has been on radio and TV and all sorts of things. Welcome For 59 years. 59 50, years, look at that. 59 years, and here I am, just with you, Paul, ready to talk about radio. Isn't wow. that astonishing? Well, Tony has run Radio 6 International for decades now. It's an internet radio station who uh, syndicates its programming. And for that, he made a marvellous documentary called Scotland's Radio. Now, uh, you can't hear it anywhere, but he has granted us full access to it. So thank you, Tony. You'll be hearing lots of Scotland's Radio across this entire podcast series as and when it's appropriate to include it. Do go and buy his books to say thank you. So before we get to these in-car radios I've been talking about, these Daimler demonstrations and a basically an upstart startup 
temporary broadcast station in January 1923, there was actually, weeks before that, another non-BBC Glasgow station that got there first. It's called 5MG, not OMG, 5MG. But it was known basically as Milligan's Wireless Station. Now, there were two men behind it, uh, a man called Frank Milligan and a man called George Garscadden. Now, you might recall that the Marconi Company had a couple of radio stations, 2MT and 2LO, both before the BBC. And then a different wireless manufacturer, Metropolitan Vickers, they had 2ZY in Manchester, all very experimental back in 1922. So Marconi's and Metrovic are companies that sell radio sets. They were making content on the radio so that if customers bought radio receiving sets, there would be something to actually listen to. They were driving demand by making radio shows. Well, 5MG Glasgow was no exception. George owned a household appliance business, which was kind of, you know, hoovers and things like that, washing machines, uh, very, very old crude washing machines in those days, of course. And the two of them sort of got together and said, we could sell radios in the shop, but there's nothing for them to listen to. Instead of a giant wireless company behind it, like Marconi's or Metrovic, this was just a couple of shop owners. And it also launched before the BBC in October 1922. In his documentary, Tony Curry takes up the story. In Bath Street, Glasgow, Scotland's first experimental radio station opened in a flat on the fourth floor of number 141. And it didn't belong to the BBC. Milligan's wireless station had the call sign 5MG taken from the initials of its operators. One of them was Dublin-born Frank Milligan, father of future radio and TV star Primrose Milligan, and the other, his friend George Garscadden. His daughter, Kathleen, sang on 5MG with her choir. I began music when I was about seven at a wee private school in Pollock Shields. I studied at the Athenaeum, I studied singing there afterwards, after I stopped playing the piano for a while, and then I went to, I had a lovely time in London, having lessons from Sir Henry Wood. Kathleen was also lead soprano at Park Parish Church, whose minister was Reverend Dr George Reith, father of John Reith, who would employ Kathleen from March at the BBC's Glasgow station. Keep it in the family. I and my choir, in which I sang, and my organist, Mr Carruthers, were invited to that little flat to come and experiment to see if we could send our voices through the air. It was really a comical set-up, with cables from the kitchen to the dining room in the little flat, and, and a microphone like a soup plate suspended from the ceiling. And we played and we sang night after night, but nothing happened. But I'll never forget the night that I was heard. Now, this little studio was in Bath Street, Glasgow, and my parents... Our home was across the road in Soggy Hall Street, and my mother heard me in Soggy Hall Street. Of course, that was a miracle. She uh, was actually possibly the best-known voice on radio in Scotland until she died uh, at a ripe old age. Um, She presented Children's Hour, and she gave a break to countless young broadcasters because she had a We Want to Broadcast feature. Mm. Uh, which brought many, many very famous people into the business, including my wife, actually. Um, Equally, Frank Milligan's daughter was Primrose Milligan. And, of course, they both made it big in radio because when they were very young, they were just pushed in front of a microphone and told, Phil, you know? (laughs) Of course, yes. Um, It was was a a a proper radio station. It was um, a dark place and they had dark drapes and... This was the time when they thought that acoustically you had to completely deaden a room for mm, radio. Mm. Could I, I suspect it got very, very hot because there was no air conditioning in those days. Yeah. And uh, it, But it, it, it started off radio in Scotland with um, quite a lot of things that subsequently became the norm, like its own orchestra and... Uh, stories and things for children it had its own children's hour before children's hour was invented by the bbc and it was it was a great little radio station so 5mg would play gramophone records had local artists giving concerts of a first class quality 5mg survived for about five months and it could be heard from carlisle to inverness it briefly even had 
a commercial rival. Oh, yes, it's all about selling then, isn't it? You sell radio sets, you sell in-car radios. I'm amazed that in-car radio was a thing then, but radio did get everywhere. Marconi and Daimler had been working on in-car radios since autumn of 1922. They demonstrated them at the Olympia Motor Show. For the Scottish Motor Show, they wanted to demonstrate how far they'd come. Daimler wanted to uh, demonstrate this. They got uh, themselves all set up for the Scottish Motor Show and discovered, to their absolute horror, that they wouldn't be able to demonstrate it because 5MG only went on the air at night. So <laughs> so they had to do the obvious thing, and that was run their own station. <laughs> So they couldn't just... Well, I think because a lot of the time these licences were fixed, weren't they? So they couldn't sort of just say, oh, can you go on in the day necessarily? Sometimes it's easier um, to start start separate. No, I think I think actually the, the reason 5MG went on the air at night was because during the daytime, George Gascadden and Frank Milligan were running their businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could only do... They could, I mean, people, people didn't get paid for this. No, it's I mean, a hobby, isn't it? Yeah. It was a hobby, and um, it still is. Yeah. And it still is. Yes, it went. It went. It went up and down. There was a time when people used to make money out of being in radio, but <laughs> those days are sadly yeah. gone. And so Daimler had a choice: do they cancel and not show off their in-car radios, or do they set up their own radio station just for a week and a half? In fact, the um, the Daimler people had encountered this problem already in London. Uh, because 2LO was only on in the evening. So somehow, and I, I've never quite worked out how they managed this, but somehow they got the very first RSL license. Now, an RSL license, just to explain for the, the two of you who don't know what it is, mm-hmm. um, it is a special license that allows you to run a, a, a low-power radio station for, for a limited time, right. usually a month, sometimes just a day or two. In fact, those banned today, in 2022, from holding RSL licences include anyone with a conviction for pirate broadcasting, anyone with an unspent conviction, and the BBC itself. What good company to be in. But the the government gave them this licence to do a broadcast for the uh, Earl's Court uh, motor show. So they had the licence. So when they came up to Glasgow, they thought, well, we've got our licence. We'll just create a radio station. January the 24th, 1923, in the Scotsman newspaper. Broadcasting from Glasgow. Although the Glasgow Broadcasting Station has not yet been installed, the Daimler Motor Company, in conjunction with the Marconi Company, have received special permission to erect a temporary broadcasting station at the Daimler Company's works at Hewenden Road, Glasgow, in operation from today until Saturday, February the 3rd. Messages, songs, etc. will be transmitted from 5 until 11pm each day and all day on Sunday. And since we're talking about Marconi's, any excuse for Marconi historian Tim Wonder on this unusual broadcast? It is from the, the Glasgow Motor Show. In fact, there, there was a big write-up and Daimler sponsored it. And people were still looking to the American model where American broadcasting had exploded. Thousands of stations, all of them commercial. And people really wanted to get, saw radio as a medium to get their ideas across sadly in america some of them unsavory but also to get you know my tires are better than your tires and my bread is much fresher in the morning so the the power of radio had been identified in 22 23 its ability to literally reach into people's homes and hold people's attention so although this is a long time before commercial radio as we know it this was radio being commercial Tim Wonder went on to tell me that Daimler were rather keen to get wireless into their cars in advance of other prestigious manufacturers like Rolls-Royce, for example. Since the autumn 1922 Olympia Motor Show, Marconi had presented an in-car radio in a Daimler. In fact, Marconi himself had a chauffeur-driven Daimler whenever he was in the UK. Bear in mind, at this point, he's mostly in a yacht off the coast of Italy, retired. My guess is, and this is only a guess because we don't know, but my guess is that Daimler threw money at 2BP. I, I think they they realised that um, 5MG was amateur and that if they wanted to sell their car radios, they had to produce something really good. And so they just threw money at it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have bothered with, with news bulletins, for example. I think they got quite carried away with the whole thing. Well, it's good to um, show willing. And they did some drama. And they, they did all sorts of things. 
The Glasgow Herald, Wednesday 24th of January, 1923. The schedule for 2BP. At 5pm, a special news bulletin prepared by the Glasgow Herald and the Evening Times. Every day this week, it's Miss Mona Vivian at 5.30, Mr Lupino Lane at 6 o'clock, and at 6.30, the cellist, Mr John Dixon. Then after a children's story at quarter to seven, there's recitals of the duo art piano. So how did this temporary motor show station then relate to the BBC? Were the BBC even aware of this? See, technically, this is competition for the BBC. But, you know, don't forget there's no broadcasting station in Scotland at this point, not for a couple of months. And, of course, the Beeb knew that Daimler weren't really interested in going into the broadcasting business. So they weren't a proper rival. Marconi's, of course, were involved in both ventures, the Daimler tests and the BBC. So I think it's fair to say this wasn't really a rival as such. They just let them get on with it. But that didn't mean that it was plain sailing. You see, our newspaper detective, Andrew Barker, has spotted something very minor, very niche, but slightly, I think, significant. And it's all about who was providing the news bulletins for the Glasgow Motor Show broadcasts. The news bulletins, 23rd to the 26th of January, were listed as special news bulletins prepared by the Glasgow Herald and Evening Times. But the bulletins for the 27th were billed as news bulletins from the British Broadcasting Company by favour of the Glasgow Herald and Evening Times. So deducing from this that maybe the BBC were aware of these, you know, and, and sort of helping a little bit towards the end of it, maybe. It's difficult to know because there is, there, there are, apart from what's in the newspaper um, archives, uh, which is not a lot, um, there's very little that was written about 2BP because it came and went. And, and actually, that really is the case for all of radio because radio... Uh, was um, something that just came and went and you heard the programme and it was gone and there was no record of it. Um, w- which makes it quite difficult for us now, looking backwards, mm. to, to know what really was going on. So what about this Saturday news bulletin then being provided by the BBC? Well, Andrew Barker, our newspaper detective, reckons that the Herald didn't produce a Sunday paper so they wouldn't have had any staff in the office, couldn't prepare a news bulletin necessarily. So you call the BBC instead. But here's a different take. I put it to Tim Wonder, our Marconi historian, and he speculated the pressure and maybe fear of newspaper proprietors who were getting caught up with this motor show in Glasgow, then being chastised because live news wasn't allowed at that time of day. It's all very complicated. They're all learning, almost like a, I don't know, a village fate giving radio a go, but then working out there's a lot more bureaucracy than they thought. Maybe it's a good job. This was just for 11 days. Here's Tony Curry. The thing was that they um, they did it terribly well, and they did things that 5MG hadn't done. I think they gave quite a, a kick up the old bottom to 5MG, who suddenly realised that there were lots of things that they could have been doing and weren't. They also had a church service on the Sunday, which was a bit odd because the motor show wasn't open on the Sunday. <laughs> As for the first religious broadcast in the whole of Great Britain, I actually had a tweet this week from Jim Harris. He was out for a cycle in Peckham, and he spotted a plaque, Christchurch Evangelical Church, McDermott Road, in Peckham. And the plaque says, On the 30th of July, 1922, Dr James Ebenezer Boone, 1867-1941, to broadcast the first sermon by radio in Britain to the congregation in this church. While I looked online, there's very little about this, but yes, Dr. James Ebenezer Boone was indeed the first to broadcast a religious sermon in this country, via Tuolo, it would seem. And it looks like his congregation were there in the church, and Dr. Boone was several miles away, transmitting his sermon and beaming it in, so to speak, almost a prediction of how lockdown would be in the 2020s. Although in this case, it was the opposite. The vicar was absent and the congregation was present. Unlike my church, where the vicar was in church, broadcasting to us at home on YouTube Live. This broadcasting malarkey is rather strange, isn't it? Six months after Dr Boone's first religious broadcast came Scotland's first religious broadcast on that experimental station, 2BP. Prominent in the programme was a ten minutes address by Reverend G.H. Morrison of Wellington Place United Free Church, Glasgow, on faith. From the Milne, Gavi and Bearsden Herald, reporting on Sunday the 28th of January 1923. This was clearly followed, as were also the other items. Miss Mona Vivienne of the Alhambra Pantomime sang, while her colleague, Mr Lupino Lane, the knave of hearts, gave a couple of recitations. A popular item with the children was Uncle Tom's Stories, while by the adults, a lady elocutionist recital of Burns' address to a haggis, and a man's a man for all that, 
was particularly appreciated. The programme ran for over six hours. As one sat and listened, there was ever uppermost the feelings of wonder and awe, awe begotten of the great unseen forces of nature, and wonder at the human ingenuity that has captured them and put them at the service of man. Meanwhile, what of the BBC itself? From Popular Wireless magazine, January the 27th, an overview of how the BBC was doing by one of the radio amateurs. The power of the press, for good or for evil, is universally admitted. We now have a new, and we think an equally great power working in our midst, that of the BBC. In their daily chats and comments addressed to an ever-increasing audience, they wield a power, for good or for evil, second only to that of the press itself. We all know and gladly admit that the work for the BBC is being very ably carried out and is improving day by day. There is much to praise, little to complain of, but there is ample excuse for just a word of warning. We have had one instance of political party matter, which was scarcely fair, and we know the excuse made was we were not broadcasting but merely experimenting. That is scarcely good enough, for at present all the transmissions are more or less of an experimental nature. And one of the bedtime stories was hardly suitable stuff for our little ones. We do not hear so much about that very unpleasant place, hell, now, as we're used to in the good old days. And it was not a very suitable tale for the little minds to sleep on. Why not give us some of those delightful little gems from the Never Never stories by Rudyard Kipling? Never. Oh dear, controversial material on the air from Auntie Beeb then, including bedtime stories about hell, apparently. Elsewhere on January the 27th, John Reith, the general manager, wrote in his diary that Peter Eckersley had come to see him about Riddle, and that Reith was considering him for chief engineer. More of that next episode. There's a little thing I, I spotted. Popular Wireless magazine, January 27th. Nothing to a Daimler, but it says, A taxi cab fitted with an aerial and listening inset complete uh, is plying for hire at Nottingham. Owned by Mr Frank Lees, an enthusiast in scientific research. He's fitted the cab up so that patrons can enjoy broadcasting with a two-foot-high aerial earth by a cycle chain. So there we go. So in-car radios were uh, starting to come in very, very soon, it seems. The the old cycle chain trick was, of course, um, the means in the 50s by which um, you were supposed to avoid car sickness. Uh, you would fit a, a little cycle chain to the back of the car and, and uh, it earthed it. And supposedly it avoided car sickness. I have to say, when I was a boy, it didn't work for me. <laughs> the Daimler Marconi broadcasts on 2BP. Well, they were continuing a plenty. On Tuesday the 30th of January 1923, the same performers once again, Miss Mona Vivienne, Mr Lupino Lane and Mr John Dixon. But first at five o'clock, the Lord Provost delivers a short address. From the Glasgow Herald, 31st of January 1923, on the Lord Provost's speech. Through the medium of the Daimler Company's temporary broadcasting station, Sir Thomas Paxton, the Lord Provost, last night gave a brief address on the recent developments of the application of wireless telephony. He could foresee enormous developments of broadcasting and could conceive many of the advantages which it possessed. The most important of these was that it brought within the reach of peoples and districts widely separated information and intelligence of an important character. The Lord Provost then referred to the inestimable advantage which the invention would be to people who were bedridden and unable to move from their homes by enabling them to keep in touch with outside interests. At the conclusion of his speech, the Lord Provost, accompanied by Lady Paxton, listened in to the transmission of music by means of a receiving set fitted in a Daimler car. Now, when I say they had radios fitted to them, you have to picture this. Um, sort of somewhere around the, the, the tailboard, uh, there was a, a huge, stonking great radio with wires and things everywhere. The car to which the receiver set has been fitted is a 30-horsepower, seven-seater Lord Alette of a well-known Daimler model. The Glasgow Herald on the 25th of January, 1923. On the roof of the car is the aerial, which consists of a small square of copper foil and is quite inconspicuous. In later models, it's intended that the aerial will be concealed inside the roof of the car. The main part of the apparatus is placed under the driver's seat. Access to it is given by a panel opening into the body of the car. Beside the seat inside the car is a small box containing the switches controlling the apparatus, the sockets for the connections to the four head telephones, which enable four persons to listen in. These in-car radios had rather limited range. They didn't really work inside garages. You had to park up and set it working where you were. And I don't think you could actually listen to it on the move. I think mm. you had to stop the car 
and turn the radio on. It does make you wonder if the punters even realised at the motor show you know, they would see static cars with working radios. Perhaps they'd assume that radio would work when the cars were on the move. And these Daimler cars were actually parked at the exact right distance from the transmitter to give the very best reception. Oh yes, showing off to the customers. ka -ching. On Thursday, the 1st of February, 1923, before the usual broadcasters of 2BP, Miss Mona Vivienne, Mr Lupino Lane, Mr John Dixon, the cellist, there's an announcement, first of all, about the BBC coming. Ooh, I wonder what that will be like. And close downs an hour later at 11pm. This is due to a special celebration of the motor show with a rose dance, organised by the Scottish Motor Trade Association. Incidentally, 2BP had 3,000 listeners. Okay. Which, which, when you consider the time and the situation, was pretty damn good. That's not bad, actually, is it? That's not bad. The ultimate close-down of 2BP on Saturday the 3rd of February with Old Lang Syne at 10pm. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? I don't think so. Do you? Those Daimler Marconi broadcasts on 2BP were only ever temporary. But 2BP as a call sign, well, that was on the move, ironically, for a motor show. 2BP was dismantled and taken to Dublin, where the uh, the station appeared again to promote the ability of the Daimler cars to receive radio. Uh, but also, it became the very first radio station ever in Ireland. So 2BP was 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 a kind of weird station because it only broadcast, I think, for a total of thirty days. Uh, 10 days in London, 10 days in Glasgow, 10 days in Dublin. Um, and it was clearly uh, the first, the world's first peripatetic radio station. But it does have a place in history um, for doing so many things that nobody had done before. Now, 2BP may have left Glasgow and the BBC station hadn't yet arrived. And so 5MG, if you remember, Milligan's wireless station, that one that had been on since October of 22, with Milligan and Carscadden just trying to sell a few wireless sets. Well, they carried on for a few more weeks. The Scotsman newspaper on the 13th of February 1923 noted, The first of a series of musical entertainments arranged by Mr James Henderson was carried through last night, the sound carrying distinctly. They were a bit like 2MT and Rittle. They had no immediate need or inclination to stop broadcasting. Apart from the fact that, like 2MT, there was that greater oh, threat, if that's not too strong a word, of the BBC. See, the BBC had the sole broadcast licence from now on. These experimenters would at some point have to pull the plug. In the case of 5MG, they carried on into February and March of 1923, filling the gap, really, before the BBC Glasgow station would begin in March. But Mulligan and Garscadden knew their days were numbered. But like Peter Eckersley on 2MT, that was OK, because they were about to join the BBC as well, as Tony Curry explains. 5SC bought everything from, mm. from Milligan's wireless station, including Milligan. <laughs> um, the, the BBC just went and bought everything. They bought the whole lot, the transmitter, the lot, mm. and, and moved it a few doors down to a different building and called it 5SC. It, it's but funny. actually, 5SC was really exactly the same as, as 5MG. Mm. It, it had the, the BBC imprimatur. I, I was looking for the little information out there to see, oh, when did 5MG close down? Did it, you know, did it close down? And you think, well, actually, what happened is everything, people, kit and, and all, just moved to 5SC. So it's, it seems to have stopped when 5SC started. Because yeah, it, it, it would happened. have stopped. It would have stopped a little beforehand, you know, do the deals and sign things. Yeah. But I, I, there is no, there's no recorded date of 5MG's demise. No. More of that on a future episode when Tony Curry will return. But I do think in those two early Glasgow stations, you almost see the two halves of that future BBC Glasgow station, 5SC. You've got the kit and the staff and the entrepreneurial spirit of Milligan's wireless station, 5MG. But you've got the organised schedules demonstrated on 2BP the high culture, the religious broadcasts, the music hall stars. You combine those two, 2BP and 5MG equals 5SC, the BBC's Glasgow station, two months later. Now, before we go, I promised you a little more from Neil Wilson back in the Watch It Radio Museum in Somerset. And he's got some marvellous kit there, including this from D-Day. The BBC's yeah. first portable sound recorder. Oh, is it? Type C machine. Yeah. Barely portable, you might say. Oh, look at that, yeah. Yes. 
and then you've got the, the, the amplifier power unit and a crate of batteries, or two crates of batteries, wow. actually. The one wow. one. This one, I believe, um, according to its serial number, and according to a list I've seen, was issued to Colin Wills, who was, uh, who, who there's, there's recordings of him going ashore in a landing craft on D-Day. So this is the sort of thing they would have there on the D-Day yeah, yeah. beach to yeah, communicate. Yeah, this is incredible. along with them. Incredible. Uh, a, big, a pile of discs in the back there. You get three minutes recording time. Right. Uh, this is an outside broadcast desk. Okay. Known as a Longdon desk, because it was uh, developed by uh, BBC chap Johnny Longdon. This desk, um, possibly Radio 1 or Radio 2, but it was... Um, uh, okay. Each, each had two desks, and uh, and this, this was one of them. BBC cup and a BBC cup holder. <laughs> Look at that. This is as it could be. Well, anyway, you've got to come here to the yes. Radio Museum. <laughs> You're here and watch it by the Somerset Seaside uh, here perfectly for summer holidays. Thank you much indeed. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, sir. Just a little taster there. For the full 20-minute video, see the link in the show notes and you can watch that for free. Other videos I put on my Patreon page. You can chip in, help the show and watch the videos there, including walking tours and me reading you bits of Cecil Lewis's broadcasting from within. Patreon.com slash Paul Carenza. Chip in £5 a month and you can get access to those videos and behind-the-scenes notes from me. Thank you, Neil Jackson, who has joined us in the last couple of weeks and the many others who chip in and help us there. It is truly appreciated and keeps us in books and research. As for Watch It Radio Museum, do go there in person this year. Make that an ambition of yours and tell Neil I sent you. I will be there myself in a matter of days for the first broadcast show, paulcarenza.com slash tour for details of that. And thank you, Neil, once again for showing us around your fine museum. Thank you, Tony Curry and Tim Wonder. Do go and buy their books. So where do we point li listeners who think, this Tony Curry fella, I'd like to know more, I'd like to experience more of his um, radio charms. Where, where do we point them to? We point them to www.radio6radiosix.com. There you will find oh. me and some really very interesting radio because um, Radio 6 specialises in unsigned and indie bands. And as for my new book, Auntie and Uncles, the novel based on the BBC origin story, do look out for it later in 2022 if I can get my finger out. And it turns out I've got lots of podcasts to edit, so that's keeping me away from my typewriter. In fact, I must buy a typewriter. I'd completely forgotten to get one. Thank you for listening and supporting the show and sharing what we do online. You can find us on Twitter and on Facebook. And if you could actually tell some people, either in person, might be quite nice, or via social media, sharing our posts, that sort of thing, it truly helps. Because unlike many podcasts, we don't have the backing of a giant corporation like the early experimenters Milligan and Garskadden. We are just a small, upstart, individual person here, and we would love your help in spreading word of what we are doing. Next time, January into February 1923, Peter Eckersley switches sides and joins the company he's been mocking for months. Oh yes, they always come back to Auntie. The British Broadcasting Century is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. Original music by Will Farmer. Archive clips are either public domain due to age, or some rights may reside with owners we know not whom. BBC content is used with kind permission. BBC copyright content reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation. All rights reserved. Stay informed, educated and entertained. Join us next time for Peter Eckersley at the BBC. And Professor David Handy, author of this year's landmark BBC book. On the British Broadcasting Century. <laughs>